Yes, so let's move very quickly um, to, this is an area that I know a lot of people, not just physicians, but our public want to hear about, and I would like to invite um, the moderator for this session, uh, Ms. Empress, Golden Empress, um, to come to the stage. Empress is a media personality, social entrepreneur, and youth advocate. <laughs> and the advocacy part is so yeah, important. That's why I'm here. <laughs> oh, thank you. Mm. I am so honored to be in the midst of masters of medicine. Give yourselves a round of applause. Mm. Woo. <laughs> this is, I think, a very exciting moment. Am I ready? Or you, oh, you're ready. Okay, you're I'm ready. ready. I'm not coming on to speak, Dr. Patrick. Oh, you're not going to speak? No, we but don't. Dr. Bond. That's why I came all the way from St. Dan to hear you. Please, a private, a private one. one, no problem. Let yes. Okay. So which mic will I use? This one. Thank you so much. It's on green. Please start the clock. I have an announcement to make for all speakers. When you bless the microphone and ignite us with so much power, passion, and knowledge. When the light is green, we will be able to receive it. When the light goes orange, our brains are shutting down. We're not dying, but our brains are shutting down, and we ask you to wind it up. Ladies and gentlemen, why am I excited to be here today? When we look at culture, when we look at technology, when we look at the myths, when we look at opportunities, when we look at a better world, who is responsible to make our world better? When we're talking about healthcare, which is wealth, who's responsible? Us. And how are we going to do it? We all know the story. We've heard the statistics. We know what's going on in the world. We hear the challenges with resources, with lack of data. But what I see here, when I see you, when I feel your energy, is I, I feel that there's an opportunity to change the world for the next generation. Now, the problem in Jamaica, somebody who works with thousands of young people, is that we do lack resources, but the challenges to healthcare is lack of information, lack of knowledge. So when we heard earlier about the cost of health care, it's frightening. Every day I meet somebody who says, boy, I can't afford, I can't afford the medicine. I can't afford this. I can't afford that. Now recently I brought my dad back from Australia who's dealing with prostate cancer and diabetes. And when he came, I had to get a new health insurance. And I think a very big conversation when we're talking about health and wealth and medicine is to enlighten the people about the power of insurance and how it can benefit you when you are a child having to look after your parent when they pass away or when you get older, when you become sick, how do you take the burden off your family? I'm speaking very quickly because I have one minute. There's so many conversations to have when we look at the Jamaican culture and how we are not utilizing the information and the knowledge that we have to make life better for everybody else. So dealing with his health care before we got the insurance, the CCRP, Sajikor insurance for him, he was hospitalized. And it cost me $300,000 when I swiped the card and I just started crying. I said, oh my God, because we just left Australia with the best health care, right? So just imagine somebody else who can't access it. And it is not fair that we have the information and we keep it to ourselves. So we need to find a way to spread the information such as drug serve, free clip. Did you know? Did you know for all of you who have money that if you have diabetes and you're prescribed with Lantos, you all know what Lantos is, right? You can get it free. All you have to do is go to a public hospital or a public clinic and you can go and save some money and invest it into the development of research and healthcare for all the things that we're hearing we need today. What I'm actually asking you to do is to look at it not from an individual approach but a collective vision. We have to have a mission like Mary C. Cole. She was selfless and she didn't care whether she had the money. She helped everybody who was in front of her. If you don't know who she is, she's our heroine. She's our legacy. That's a story that we need to look at to make life better and health and wealth better for our people. She did what she could do, and she used her other opportunities to help anybody who was in need. And that's what I'm asking you to do here today. Let's all dream big. How can we change the world with our information? Knowledge is power. 
And if we don't help others, then we will not live in a world where it's happy and peaceful. People are stressed out. Stress leads to what? When we talk about heart, heart disease, what does stress lead to? Do you know how stressed out our people are living in poverty? And then I also want to raise a question about the solution to health care and wealth. And I'm not afraid to talk about reparation. The 10-point CARICOM plan, when we look at health, when we look at righting the wrong and asking those who have contributed to the suffering that we have, when we look at the risk factors, how can you contribute to helping our health care to get the research, the investment, and the resources so that we can help our people who have suffered at the hands of the colonizers who enslaved us and have contributed to most of the sicknesses we are speaking of today. Are you with me? It's a conversation to have. Let's look at, um, was it Georgetown University when we talk about advocacy and where they decided through advocacy of the students and others that they would provide tuition to those who were the, de the, the descendants of slavery. Wow! What man has done, man can do, but we must advocate. And I'm a big dreamer. And I believe as a social entrepreneur, one day we'll have an app where people will be able to turn on the app and run it over their head and it says, you need to stop eating so much sugar. You have diabetes and diabetes will lead to. We have so many innovative young people in front of us and we can show them how to change the world with their creativity and their imagination. But you have to impart the information that you have inside of your minds. Things that you know, share it. Information and knowledge is power. And that's when we'll have a truly healthy and wealthy society. Thank you so much for allowing me to share my heart. The clock is on zero. I get excited about what I do. And now I'd like to introduce to you your very first speaker. Dr. The Honorable Henry Lowe a man I admire. Doc, I went to buy some alpha prostate the other day for my daddy, and you were out. And guess what? Are you making so much money? Why is everybody buying it? Do you all know about the alpha prostate one? You don't? I used to buy it before my dad moved here every single two, three weeks and ship it to Australia. It is the best, all right? And everybody's talking about it. So if you have prostate, order up today, right? You have a link for the international guest. A link it means somebody you know and you get quicker access to healthcare. Alpha prostate, Dr. Lowe. Let me continue. He, no, I need to read the actual bio, right? No, because we don't have time. But I do want to share with you, for those who don't know, and I always talk about when we're looking at information, a lot of young people are on the internet and not using it to benefit them when we're looking at information and access to health care, sometimes the information is out there, but they're not using the technology to access it. Dr. The Honorable Henry I. C. Lowe is an adjunct professor in the Department of Medicine, University of Maryland School of Medicine, USA, and a distinguished adjunct profes professor of ethnomedicinal chemistry. Hmm, the man that mixes up the good potion. Oh, yes. Contributing approximately 50 years in the fields of science and technology, energy, and the environment, wellness, and health sciences nationally, regionally, and internationally since graduating from the University of the West Indies, Mono. A former per permanent secretary of the government of Jamaica, Dr. Lowe researched and established the first Ministry of Science and Environment in the CARICOM region. He served as chairman as well as president and CEO of the Blue Cross Jamaica. Dr. Lowe is founder and executive chairman of the EF EHF group of companies, which includes a private and not-for-profit not organization, Environmental Health Foundation, EHF, established in 1992 to enhance the quality of people's life in Jamaica. I'm a very happy customer, and I really hope after his presentation, we will find a way to invest 
in the good things that he has in store for us in Jamaica. We have set the trend. We are the fastest in the world. We have the best music in the world, the best chemists in the world, the best doctors in the world, and he is one of them. So ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Dr. The Honorable Henry Lowe. Let's get excited. <laughs> You have to dance when you come up, you know. Dancing is therapeutic. <laughs> All right, Dr. Lowe. Careful now. <laughs> oh, what can I say? What can I do after the Empress? The Empress. Um, really, I am so thankful and impressed by your introduction. So I'll say no more except to move straight into my presentation. Um, when I was asked to, I was given the title, Mark you, so I'm just working with my title. Um, I was asked to do a presentation on phytomedicines and look at it not only for what it can do, it is doing, but how it can create wealth. Because whatever we say, without money, we're not going to achieve anything. We could have the best wishes, the best interests, if we don't have wealth, that is going to be a challenge. And as a friend of mine said only yesterday, you could be the best doctor in the world if you don't have money to continue doing what you're doing and being creative if you are, it's not going to take you anywhere. All right, so having said that, I, and I thank the uh, sponsors and everybody else who has uh, invited me to be here. Um, and the first thing is, what is phytomedicine? And as you can see there, phytomedicine is all about the plant, phyto, plant, everything that you can get from the plants for medicinal purposes. Um, history. Many persons poo-poo when they hear about plant medicines, but when I finish, you'll understand it's not what we used to think. Um, many people talk about bush medicine in a very negative way, but as you can see there, 80% of the world's population, these billions of people, depend on plant medicines for their survival, and they are doing fairly well with it. Um, only thing I want to say here is that we mustn't, as many people think, once something comes from a plant, it's safe and it's, um, you have all the efficacy and so on. Not so. You have problems there too. And um, I'm sure many of us know that. Just to very quickly um, mention here some of the um, major drugs, and this is just a handful of them, which came from phytomedicines. Um, we saw that after, and, and many of us don't know this, but since 1950s, the 1950s, we saw a big shift. We saw the, to, towards um, synthetic medicine, as we call it, that is making drugs de novo and not from plants and animals because that's how it used to be prior to that. And we got the big pharmaceutical companies which moved in, and they shifted everything towards this. Um, in this, we know in the early days, like let us take thalidomide, that created major problems. Interestingly enough, it's coming back for other indications, but uh, that was a major, major problem. And the problems with uh, synthetic medicines haven't gone away, but then, between the 1950s and the turn of 1900s, we saw a new shift back towards plant medicines. And there are many reasons for this, and I'll just touch on a few of them. As we all know, everybody's talking about vegan diets and health consciousness. We saw where our own ministry of health is now health and wellness, which shows the, the new trend, and everybody's talking about um, uh, the, the, their experiences with plant medicines. And in case we don't know, in this whole development, there's a new multi-billion dollar business for uh, veggie burgers and 
plant foods like these and people are shifting away from meats and so on. So it, it's a whole revolution taking place out there. Now, why? Why is all of this taking place? A number of things. Um, prices are better. People have a much better um, interest in this area. And of course, self-medication. We mustn't leave that out because you can't go and get um, a prescription drug um, legally uh, uh, for self-medication. So this is an area where people feel they can help themselves. Now, in all of this, we have seen, again, despite the fact that some of these plant medicines um, provided new drugs, and, and the synthetic medicines have been there and took over, and as I will mention and you'll see later, we are now moving away now towards even new and interesting plant medicines. And in fact, when you look back at e even things like um, periwinkle, what we call in Jamaica ram goat roses, many of us in this room might not know that was one of the first major drugs for cancer. It is still the only um, useful, very, very useful drug for childhood leukemia. You know the story behind this? It started right here in Jamaica. Our Jamaican doctor um, observed that the people are using um, this, this, this plant for tea to manage diabetes was noting um, differences in the white blood cell levels. Anyway, long and short of it, I, I, I have limited time. Canadian doctors came in, looked at it with our local doctors, found that it was good for leukemia, and it was taken and sent to Madagascar. It's now called Madagascar um, <laughs> Periwinkle. Jamaica never benefited from this. And a lot more of this is happening, which I, I don't have the time to go into, but that is one of the most effective and at the same time most expensive um, drug that there is out there. Um, I must give credit to the University of the West Indies because the, the chemistry department was a, a, a stalwart, a pioneer in a lot of this type of research. And just like we know, today, Jamaica's got 52% of all established um, medicinal plants of the world. We are so blessed, a lot of people don't realize this, but it's not being exploited. And this is where we need to go, and you'll see why uh, when I get on some more. Now, why then are we now looking so seriously at phytomedicines is because of the promise and the demonstration of what it can do, which is um, helping us to consider this. We saw in the last 10 years the reemergence of cannabis, ganja as we call it in Jamaica, now as a major medicinal agent. And what is more interesting about it is that when you go and do the research, you will ask yourself, is this a new wonder plant, a new wonder drug? And I will mention one or two examples of why we need to think so. But it's not new. And many of us might not realize it was used by royalty. It goes back thousands of years. It's not a new plant. And um, it was even of in the uh, pharmacopoeia of the U United States and removed in 1942. And this is when I hear people talking about uh, marijuana. We must understand that word is negative. It was all about politics and negative racism and all the rest of it. So we must realize, it's, if we're making reference to it, please say ganja or cannabis, which is the right name. Um, and moving on from there, um, just want to give you some examples of some of the work done, especially by my team, and I'll mention this in passing quickly. 
As you can see there, there are 12 plants, and cannabis now make 13 that my team and myself have been working on. And um, as we go ahead, I'll mention some of these in going, going on further. Uh, but please note, in research, especially plant research for therapeutic purposes, no one person can do it. It is the most difficult field of drug research that exists because um, not only do you need to sometimes isolate minute quantities of a bioactive um, compound from the plant, but you also have to synthesize it. And then you have to catch up now with what the synthetic or medicinal chemists do, which is to do the um, bioactive studies. And as you can see there, we have a number of collaborators, and I must um, make special reference, which is not there, to Harvard University and the sort of work that they are doing with us, and I'll tell you some more about that after. Okay. What is our contribution to this? And, and, and I'm talking about Jamaica now, and I can only speak about um, the work that we are doing. Um, we have a, a laboratory called Biotech R&D Institute on the university campus of the West Indies, and we have given 10% um, of the ownership to the University of the West Indies, and we are demonstrating there. In fact, when I was invited and given the space we're told we want to demonstrate to the university community that you can't just publish elegant papers and say that's it. Everywhere, even in conservative universities like Oxford and Cambridge in the UK, they are going now for wealth creation. Whatever research is done, the development is for wealth creation. Unfortunately, I don't think we are there yet. As you saw how much work was done in the research by UWI, very little, if anything, has gone um, commercial. Um, here, for example, we, we developed a whole range of um, nutraceuticals. Um, supplements, one of these mentioned was the alpha prostate, which is now being sold globally. People are calling us, we can't produce enough and um, even going to our local manufacturers for come on board with us, uh, you need to bring in money before we can do that. And so it goes on. Um, Empress understood a lot of what's going on here. Um, we are the first people in the world to develop what we call um, the, the, the sort of teas that we have produced from a number of our local products, and um, we have got overall now about 35 different products which we need to get distributed, um, producing commercial quantities and distributed. We're only doing small amounts um, in, in our export. And the reason is, um, perhaps I'm doing too many things, because if, if, if we had the money, we would have gone and have these as major major exports. Um, then I come to phytomedicine in, in uh, cannabis. We have now got 12 products which has been approved by the Ministry of Health as um, agents that can treat with pain and a number of other products. But guess what? We can't get it manufactured commercially in Jamaica because we hear that any of the commercial um, manufacturing companies come on board, the banks will shut them down. So everybody is scared, not even for distribution. So the next move is we will have to do it ourselves and forget those. You know, every step of the way, I don't think this country is really friendly to research, development, and innovation. And um, the millions of dollars spent has been through my own resources, friends, University of Maryland, Harvard University, and friends and colleagues who share my vision. So um, those are products that I don't have time to go into, but 
the point is that we are now looking at major export of these. If we can manufacture and if we can get export going. And you know, the unfortunate thing is, Jamaica is a leader in cannabis research. We are the first country in the world, and I take pride in saying I was party to it, to produce the first commercial product from ganja, which was Canasol. And in the list of things we have there, in the list of things we have there, we have got the, what I call the second generation of, of um, uh, products for treating glaucoma, uh, as was done with Canasol. And that is now on the market. I can't produce enough, and it's being sold um, in the United States. I was just there talking to over 200 people two weeks ago, and they gave me, I don't know why, keys to the city of Broward and the county. So <laughs> these, these things have. Now, um, let, let me just go now to uh, one or two case studies of where phytomedicines is going. And it is very important for me to just quickly back up and say, we have Biotech R&D Institute, which I referred to before, on the University of West Indies campus. And it's that small entity that has done all these nutraceutical products, and we are now into cosmeceuticals and other things which wouldn't be of interest here. <clears throat> we have 30 odd um, uh, health-related products which we have done there. And Biotech R&D Institute was the company that discovered a lot of the basic things from ganja and also from the um, ball moss or Olman's beard, which some of us know so much about. And I'll move straight into that. <clears throat> we can't do pharmaceutical research in Jamaica beyond a certain point. So it was very fortunate that uh, University of Maryland Medical School uh, give, give me all the support and um, allowed us to do so many other things and opened up a lot of what I'm doing to the world. And it's a little bit unfortunate. Um, I don't think even here at U UWI or in the Caribbean, they understand the enormity and the cutting edge nature of this work and what it means for mankind. And I'll just quickly move on here. Um, F Flavor Cure was established um, through the University of Maryland Medical School to assist me in um, developing certain drugs for cancer. And this work with, with Flavor Cure has presented two orphan drugs, one for AML, a leukemia, which is extremely difficult to treat. And the new danger, biggest type of cancer, pancreatic cancer, for which there's really no treatment, not even treatment. We're not talking about cure treatment. And what I don't think many of us realize is the enormity of these two FDA awards, because nobody else in the developing world has ever had an FDA for these types, given, given this um, designation for orphan drug. So it's very, very important. Good news, things are going great. In fact, we are going to market in Canada to raise more funds to hopefully complete the clinical trials uh, for this pancreatic cancer. You know, I, and I say this because right now, no, I'll leave it until later. Yes, so we have these two major ones, and then you can see there, um, we have a lot of pipeline drugs which are to come. Now, let me just say this very quickly. We, we and I won't tell you what part of Jamaica we got it from, but in the research for medicinal ganja, medicinal um, cannabis, we did a search 
and we came up with a plant, a, a, a strain which we call the black swan. You're going to hear more about it. And it is the only ganja strain in the world that produces the flavonoids which is giving us these major new drugs. And um, it, it's, it's something we're going to publish and you'll hear more about. So let me leave it there. Then um, the second company that we established in Baltimore, Maryland, is Lothera. And it focuses on neurodegenerative diseases, um, uh, viral diseases, and these are all compounds we have isolated from ganja, which are doing this. And I just got a new um, patent issue for ocular diseases. So, you know, it's, it's, it's all excitement. The university is there. They're helping us. And if I may go back to saying to you that uh, Flavor Cure, we are working closely with um, Harvard University. They recently developed um, a, a new delivery mechanism. Part of the big problem with drug, develop, drug delivery in, in therapy is that um, the side effects are great. Harvard just developed a new technology called the drone technology, which takes the drug directly to the site where the disease is. So the side effects are nominal. This is cutting edge science, and guess what? We are part of that. And we now load on our drug, FBL, onto that deliver mechanism, and that is where we are now going. So that is going to be a world beater in short term. Now, going back to Lotharia, um, we have a number of pipeline drugs there which are coming up. And then we have Education and Scientific LLC. Again, we couldn't do a lot of this work here in Jamaica, so we had to take it to the United States. And um, the University of Maryland has got 15% of this company, so it shows faith they're investing in us. But guess what? I have been talking to people in business here. They don't want to know if it's not a house or a car to sell. They are not willing to put a dime into research and development. And this is why I am sorry to say, if we don't wake up and realize that research and development is critical, not only to development, but survival, I don't think Jamaica has much of a future. And I'll just say here that one of the new developments that we got, and many of us here know I've been doing a lot of research on prostate cancer, we now have a drug uh, which has passed two of the three phases of drug development, um, approved by FDA. Phase one, which is safety, and they are big on that. Phase two is efficacy using relatively small numbers of patients for that. And phase three is when you combine phase one, phase two with a larger number. I decided instead of that being done in the United States to do it here in Jamaica. Why? First of all, Jamaica and Nigeria, in, in a, uh, an article that came out recently, are the uh, two countries with the highest level of um, incidences as well as death from prostate cancer. Why is this important? Why am I saying I want to do that work in Jamaica and bring everything here? One, prostate cancer and our uncles, fathers, brothers, it's there everywhere. I think I'm correct in saying 70% of every male black male in Jamaica and Nigeria will get prostate cancer at some stage. It might not be major to kill you. As you get older, you either die or you can live with it until you die. But the fact is, it's there. And what's even more, we just discovered recently 
that there's an aberration in one of the genes which makes prostate cancer deadly because it, it creates metastasis and the disease is spread very rapidly. We have developed this drug um, which is supposed to be, supposed to be, all indications are there and we have the data, um, be about the best drug and we want to make it affordable. Just to let you know, um, for you to get the top, top of the line therapy for, for prostate cancer, you need to have 85,000 US dollars to 185,000 US for, th for, 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 your, for your therapy. How many poor persons in Jamaica and developing world can get it? Little or none. We feel that this is going to be major because um, the, the two drugs of choice today are bringing, have been bringing earnings of 5.5 billion, not million, 5.5 billion dollars to the, to the drug companies. I don't know if they will come after us if they realize we are intent to dent what they have, but we are going there still, we are going after it. But what we want to do more than all is not the money, but to make it affordable and accessible to the developing world. And we are hoping that when we get this done, and we should be there for market within the next 18 to 20 months, what we want to do is give Jamaica the credit and the praise to be the country that created and developed this type of therapy to help so many black males in the world. We are looking, and I'll say it straight up, Empress did indicate to us about what is the art of the possible. Um, we are go if for us to do it here in Jamaica, we are going to need private placement. We don't want to go on the stock market yet because it's not a lot, lot of money we're looking for. But I've passed the word around to see how many of our companies or leadership in Jamaica will support this. And um, the Jamaica Cancer Society will be with us, so you'll hear more about it. And then, finally, um, the futures of phytomedicines. There's a tremendous potential there. Um, only a very small percentage of the plants have been looked at. Um, it's becoming increasingly attractive for research and development. Um, we need to do further research to move not only from um, so-called bush medicine, but to, to pharmaceuticals. Um, we have linkages that we need to use some more. And um, we, just by way of just letting you know what some of our work is going to lead to, Cancer, the incidence of cancer. And this is not like in poor Asia and poor Africa. We're talking about just in the developed and more developing countries, the senior developing country. One seventy-four billion dollars. That's a burden on the society. And um, I, if I may take malaria. Malaria, $12 billion. We have many problems, many opportunities, and um, at the end of the day, what is it going to do for us? New, new jobs, patents, and we have a global market value for all that I mentioned here of $120 billion. And we need to do our bit to make sure that we can help our fellow men to achieve quality health. Thank you.